Hello, friends. Now, the years from 1970, 70s to say 80s and so on, forward. What you find is the period of grand theory movement. I think you are familiar with this. Grand theory movement. 1970s, 1980s and so on. The period of the grand theory movement. And this grand theory movement, you can see feminism, Marxism, post-modernism, post-structuralism, before the structuralism, and then I am not frightening you with these words, post-colonialism. So these are deconstruction as these are we said grand theorism. So from 1970s onwards you find this a movement called you can say a group of these things under the grand theory movements. But, but, but before that, say 1940s, 30s, 20s, going back, 40s and so on, you find the another group of movement, just now we saw half a dozen lectures already we have done, new criticism, new criticism. Now, new criticism mainly focused on the text, not the autobiography or biography of other or political movements or culture or anything extra text, anything extraneous to text, they did not take into account. Listen, and you know, we have seen what Liam Brooks said, text is an autonomous thing. And you have to look at the text, the higher just close reading and principles of practical criticism. So you, you find that the text is the center of attraction. So that is new critical or new criticism against it. Now the American new critics, two great American new critics against it, William Kurtz Wimsett and Monroe C. Beardsley, they have coined two new phrases her intentional fallacy and affective fallacy. Affective fallacy. Intentional fallacy means trying to uh, criticism that is based on the intention of the other at the time of producing that form. Affective fallacy in simple English, in simple language we can say, or simple terms we can say, affective fallacy is the emotional response of the reader. That is at the receiving end, the other is at the origin, the point of origin. Now if you take this now, just common man's understanding of this. If you take Mona Lisa for example, the painting by Leonardo da Vinci. Now you will find that what is, what is the, what may be the possible intentions of the other, very difficult to find. Isn't it? Yes, even today, it can be a smile, a secret smile can be an ironic smile, can be the, the, the expressions of uh, the conscience of a woman, but it can, it can be that she is not pleased, something like that. So then, what is the intention of the author? How are you going to know this? By origin, point of origin, if you know, that, you, that is not going to help you. And also you are uh, the result of that, or the Emotions created in you, that also is not going to help you. Or take the example of LG written in a country churchyard. Simple crime, probably all, all of you, all of us, we have done it in our MA classes, isn't it? The LG written in a country churchyard. Now what is the interest of the author? Is it universal, uh, universal principles? Or is it a philosophy? Is it uh, is it an abstract sympathy? Is it the fear of his own fear of death and say mortality and loss of immortality? Things that he will not be remembered? Is it because of that? We don't know. You can see now, 
point of birth, you won't help you. Also, you are emotionally free. Or you have got another uh, very clear example is that is of the wasteland. The wasteland originally had 1000 plus lands. Now it was Ezra Pound who edited this. So whose intention is the poem? Is it Pound's intention or Elias' intention? We don't know. So, and also we know the, the emotional effect that it creates. So there is a, you can see waves of emotional effect you will find when you read that poem. So there also it won't help you. Now take our most familiar and the greatest of all poets, Sonatius Shakespeare. You say some say some say it is dark lady of the sun, some say it is fair youth, some say it is his fear of death and death. As just now we said about uh, uh, grey mortality, the fear of death, and the fear that he won't be remembered. And he says one of his uh, uh, sonnets he says no, no marble, nor the the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive my reign. <laughs> so that is, I have written this for my, for making me immortal, immortality. And uh, sailing to Baisandir, it is said that it is because of his fear, his fear of death and uh, oblivion. He is afraid that he will become oblivious. And so what happens, he says, I shall take such a form. Are the golden as the Grecian goldsmiths make. So is it that, or is it? As we have seen, uh, one of the interpretations is uh, Tamasoma Jyotirgami. Is it? No. Therefore, again, Hopkins. Is it an autobiography, or is it? He is uh, thinking about the. Selfless sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. He wants to become like that. We don't know. So this is intention of the author or the emotion of the reader will not take you anywhere. So they have Wimsett and Beardsley. Their book, collection of essays, The Verbal Icon. The Verbal Icon. The Verbal Icon, published in 1954, but started writing in 1941, 1952, up to 11 years of hard work. The introduction, Wimsett says like that, introduction to the book. Says, the first two essays, 11 long years they took for writing this, writing and revising and so on. Of course, the publication, that was in 1954. The title of the first two, titles of the first two essays, first one is, as we have already seen, Intentional Fallacy and the other is Affective Fallacy, the second one. Now, the verbal icon, essays, first two essays, etc. I told you. Now, the new criticism itself is a modernist movement. They opposed the author as the primary source of meaning of the text. New criticism. This is also part of new criticism. Remember I told you when he came to the end of new criticism, that is the sixth lecture I said, this is only a temporary stop. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening. <laughs> that is, we will continue. Miles to go before we, before we sleep. Understand? So continue, it will continue for some more time. New criticism. Now the new intentional fallacy, it is, uh, it, it's the other side of this effective, affective fallacy. We can say it's a romantic one. Romantic. It is the expression actually. See, it is the expression of the romantics. And this expression of the men, the expression theories of romantics, you can see developed by Andy Collins and Benedetto Croce. Probably you might have again come across these names by now. Because you are doing, when you are, see, I am speaking not to, not, I am, my lectures are directed to a small group of people, that is postgraduate students of English. 
That's why I am saying, Prabhu, you might have come across this. Now, if not, are the callings? Are the callings? And Benedetto, Benedetto, Italian, Croce. Italian language is phonetic language. Phonetic language means you write and read in the same way. Phonetic. But English is an alphabetic language. So this is uh, the international fallacy at the root of it. You know, if you go deep into it, you will find that there are expression theories of romantics, very closely related, and developed by R. G. Cohen and uh, Benedetto Croce. Uh, but what we have to do is we have to move away from it, and then take the critical idiom of the new critics that the text. Itself. The text itself, <coughs> that is the critical view. The text itself, that is the critical view of the new critics, the text itself. So, affective theories, uh, you can say that begins with the private subjectivity of the critic. Isn't it? Affective theories. That is critical theories that begins with theories that begin with private subjectivity of the critic. Means what I feel, critics feeling. On the one is the point of origin, the intention of the author. The other is subjectivity of the critic. Emotions, imaginative activities in the mind, even physiology, as in emeritic sense, goosebumps. Goosebumps, physiology. Emily Dickinson, American poet. You know? Yes. So what happens is that the intentional fallacy is a confusion. Affective fallacy is also a confusion. The intentional fallacy is a confusion between. Now you will be able to say that origin, the origin of the poem and its and its a confusion between the between the poem and its origin. That's the thing. Between the poem, confusion, international fallacy, IF. Confusion between the poem and its origin. And EF, affective fallacy, confusion between the poem and its results. So we can sum up like this. To sum up this, the whole thing, you can say like this, because this is a very introduction. The poem and its origin, and the poem and its results. Understand? So then, what is what the what is what it is, so to say, and what it does? Origin is what it is, and uh, the result is what it does. So two questions: what it is, what the poem is, and what it does. This is so. Based on this, we have got the international fallacy and affective. Now the question is: uh, This begins by trying to derive the standard of criticism. This intellectual uh, twins, some people call it this intellectual twins. The beginning of this intellectual intellectual twins, you can see a search for. The standard of criticism. What is the standard of criticism? How to derive a standard of criticism? That is the, that is the, the you can see the effort behind this to find out the standard. Make criticism scientific. So that was the aim of the new critics as well. You can see. So from the psychological effects of the poem, or ends in impressionism and relatives. You understand that? What are we going to do? The effects of the poem, if you think about the psychological effects of the poem, it will end in what? It will end in impressionism and religious. So then what is the standard of it? Now, outcome of both fallacies, you find the poem disappears. The poem disappears. Who is important is the author, or who is the important is the who is important is the reader. And what is the, where is the poem? What are we going to do with the text? What has happened to the text? 
So outcome of both these fallacies, if you are following these two fallacies, the poem will simply disappear. Understand? So then, what is the standard of criticism? The primary standard of criticism, so for judging the poetic merit, what is the standard? You want to judge the poetic merit, the merit of the poem, the meaning of the poem. You want to understand it. What should you do? You have to go again, once again, I would like to write this point. That is, first is, standard of any standard of any scientific, any standard of any scientific criticism should be based on the text itself. Text. Text itself. So that is the confusion, we have got a confusion now, whether intention or affective. So we say it is the text itself. Understand? And then we have got, there is another point that comes up here is, first you have to see the standard. What is the standard? Standard of criticism. Second is, if you have, suppose you become a victim of intentional fallacy or affective fallacy, what will happen? There is a question of relatives. Relativism, that is a point not here. And relativism will kill any scientific approach. Relativism. Understand? That is, it is an unwanted consequence of intentional fallacy or affective fallacy. Relativism, because what you relate to, you relate it to other or you relate it to the, to the audience. That is the reader. That is dangerous. Then another issue that comes up here is the distinction between private and public. Private and public. See, when you think about intention, then private. When you think about uh, the result or the emotional effect, then that is also private. But actually it is not a private property at all. Well, you, should, you have to see this. Take a distinction between speech act theory. Speech act theory. What does the speech act theory say? The speech act theory says, makes a distinction between uh, the speaker and the language. Understand? So speaker's meaning and the sentence meaning. The speech act theory makes a distinction between the speaker's meaning and the sentence meaning. Sentence means language. A simple example, Brutus is an honorable man. Brutus is an honorable man. Brutus is an honorable man. So look at this. The difference between speaker's meaning and sentence meaning we can easily find out here. Speaker's meaning is private, sentence meaning is public. So too, intention of the author is private. And uh, the meaning of the words in the poem that is public because language is a public possession. And even the subject matter of that poem is a is public of a public property. Why? Right? Because it's about human beings or nature, whatever it is. It is not the poet's own property. Understand? So those this Wimsat and the Beersley they say the moment the poem is born, like a child is born, the umbilical cord is cut off. The child becomes an independent child gets an independent existence, exactly like that. The moment the poem is born, then it is not, the poet cannot claim that. He may be the efficient cause of that, he might have put things together. So that, but, so here again you find what is called, another issue that is coming up, the fixed nature of meaning and the unfixed nature of meaning. Understand? Fixed nature of meaning, the fourth point to consider is fixed and unfixed nature of 
nature of meaning. So here it is. At the speaker's level it is fixed, but at the sentence level it is not. It will be different meaning. Suppose you don't know anything about Brutus is an honor of that context. So what is the meaning? Sentence meaning. Brutus is an honor of So that is just to show you the difference between, uh, the distinction between, distinction that is derived from speech act theory. That is speaker distinction between speaker's meaning and the sentence meaning. Understand? I think you are following me. Yeah. So there you go. So they said that, a poem is public and objective. So that is what this. A poem, the status of a poem, it is not private. It cannot be related to anybody. It is, it is public. This is the status of the poem. Public and objective. It is a public property and not private property. Because it is written in language and language is public property. It is written about objects and they are also public property. So you cannot say this, this is the intention by trying to find out the biography, the biography of the author. So you can see you know, when you take your further studies, I.R. Richardson, so you will find. I.R. Richardson, he, he made, he did something, what is called practical criticism. He took away all the details of biography and other cultural background, etc. of a poem and gave it to them. Even sometimes if it is a long poem, part of it. And the students, they simply stood there according to our knowledge of it. They did not know what to do. So, your uh, tradition, you know, the way you were looking at a work of art, for a very long period of years, just based on the knowledge that you have of the other or the cultural context. Later on, you will see another theory that's a different thing for the time being. So, as the new critics, these are also new critics. New critics, their contribution to literary criticism and the discovery of the meaning of a text is that you should focus your attention on the text itself because it is a public problem and it is about public themes therefore the text so facts about the at the same time you should not think that it's all together uh, that they are against the facts about the other or they are against uh, that is the literary uh, reception. No. They said that you can have facts about the world. You can have a long story of the literary reception of a work. That is the response of the readers. You can have. But the point is, there is a point of no return where an, an obsession, what is the obsession that is about the text. It shouldn't be at the expense of the text, that's what they are saying. So the main, the abstract of what I have been telling you so far is, if you want to sum up, you can say, these two are new critics, like the other new critics and formalists, for example. You are formalists, or T.S. Eliot was a formalist. a formalist. I. R. Richard is a formalist. So, as the formalist, and the Russian formalism was Jacobson, and uh, such people, formalists, then uh, new critics, this is also part of that movement, international fallacy and affective fallacy. All these people, what are they saying? They are saying that you can have biography, you, you can go through the who is against it. You can also study the background of the work of the arts, work of, work of an art. I see. It's a, sorry, the products against the poem, it is a poem, it's story, story, no, no, they can do anything. But the thing that you should remember is that is not the important thing. 
your input should not stop there. Your input should be the text in your of commerce. The focus should be on the text. They are not against other. Otherwise, in the national fallacy, they say it is, it is a Longinian genetic fallacy. Another word that they use is the In the introduction to the book, the verbal icon, they use this phrase, the Longinian, Longinian, that is from uh, the theory of sublime, you know, Longinus. Longinian genetic fallacy. Genetic fallacy, that is invention fallacy. IF. And the other is the Richardsian. The Richardsian fallacy. The Richardsian. They call it the, the Richardsian affective fallacy. Yes. That is understood. The uh, Richardsian affective fallacy. So two, two other ways they describe this in the introduction to the verbal icon. The expression theories of the romantics because Longinus was one of the supreme romantics. He, his theory is transport. Listen, when you read a work of art, it should transport you, move you. So the Homer imbibed the spirit of his characters. He entered into the battlefield, that's what he says. He was fighting with the, those people who were fighting. So that is in subjective. It becomes subjective. Where's what is that? Emotion recollected in tranquility. Where's what? Poetry. Say this. Emotion recollected in tranquility. What is that? Spontaneous or for powerful emotions. So what does that mean? Expressionism. Not expressionism, that will be a different thing. Expression. Say so that is from a romantic expression, I guess. So, these new critics, they are against it, that's all. For them, the text is the important thing. You want to know about internal bilans? Should you go through, or should you go all the way through the background of uh, Birdsworth and his life? Not necessary, that's what these people say. You can go, you have no objection. But that is not necessary. If the text is with you, you can read and find out what the text says, and that is the ultimate meaning. So, sum up this today's introduction, the verbal icon, this uh, collection of essays. First two essays are intentional fallacy and affective fallacy. Intentional fallacy is about the origin of a work of art. And affective fallacy is about the emotional effect that that is created in the mind of the reader. Now both these are wrong because they are called the fallacies. The wrong approach, the right approach is the text itself. Then we have to see international fallacy is also known as Longinian, Longinian genetic fallacy. Genetic means origin. And the affective fallacy is known, known as Richardsian affective fallacy. Now one is about origin, the other is about the results. The point here is that this is not the right way to approach literature. Then what is the standard? Way? What is the right way? What is the scientific? How to make it scientific? What are the issues that has come up? First, you have to see that eh? judging the poetic merit. Standard way of judging the poetic merit is text itself that we saw. Then he said you have to make a distinction between. So th there is a question of relative symptoms in if you or uh, if you fall a prey to these fallacies, then it becomes. It is there is another another, another fallacy of relativism. Third is you have to make a distinction between us in the speech act theory. The, what the speaker's meaning and also what the language says. For this, you have to consider the fixed and unfixed uh, 
un unfixed fixed meaning and unfixed meaning. You cannot have a fixed meaning. If you fix the meaning, we go with the international fallacy or emotional fallacy. So that is an uh, affective fallacy. Then the meaning is unfixed. Now we know the play. Structure, sign and play. There it is. So there is no end to meaning. That's what they say. See that? There is no end. Signifiers and signified they are playing. <laughs> See that? Difference, difference and all those things. Those concepts. So in that case, he said, nature of meaning, fixed and unfixed. And last meaning that you have to see is that this is, the poem is not private, it's public. Because it is written in a public, they are using a public property and that is language. So the, an object, an objective thing of the or the public property that is a poem that has to be judged by scientific methods and that scientific method is the text itself. That's what we have been telling so far. At, at birth itself what happens is the poem detaches from the author. The poem self detaches, yes, automatically. Because the property the public. Now you are the people to discuss that. And emotional fallacy or uh, affective fallacy always has this problem of relativism and uh, looking through a colored glass. So there are certain issues like Thomas, that is uh, uh, T series, the wasteland, well, what, what, what emotion, how many emotions are rated in you when you read that poem? We do not, we ourselves do not know. When you go through all the 434 lines and with the different sections and so on. See, it begins April is the conclusion. Then some immediately winter, then comes summer. Summer surprised us. Summer surprised us coming, coming on the standard with a shower of rain. We, we stopped in the colonnade. Then the one is on the half bath, drank coffee, and talked for an hour. <laughs> See that? Then comes an intrusion. Big girl came to sing some else to a Jewish. Isn't it? Yeah. So that is how many? How many moods? And finally, what happens? Then you go come to the end. Shanti, shanti. This. So, you have to, all what we have been saying so far is giving focus and importance to the text itself for the, for interpretation and also for finding the meaning of the text. It does not rule out any learning, any other learning connected with the text such as Biography of the other, autobiography of the other, the situation, the politics, culture, or any such thing. That's not rule out, but most important thing is the text. I hope you have been following and enjoying this, and we'll continue this for a few more days. Because, as I told you now, new criticism is part of new criticism. What we have done is also new criticism. And what is will follow after this also new criticism. Formalism, for example. So that we will see. And after that, we will in fact if I tell you one thing, you will not even listen to me. So I don't want to tell you that. See? Because from 1970s, the whole scenario changes. But at the same time, yeah, there are issues, theoretical issues that we ought to know. And definitely will help you for for our future studies, no doubt about that. At least it will help you for the UDC that now. <laughs> he will be getting questions from this. Bye. Have a nice day and have a good